the next talk will be by Russ Crandall and Paul Jaminet. They'll be talking about possibly one of the most important topics um, personally to everybody, which is the intersection of tasty food, uh, cooking, and health, and uh, ancestral ideas. Take it away, Russ. Hi, everyone. Hello. Oh, hello everyone. I think it's on now. Uh, so hi everyone. My name is Russ Crandall. I'm co-presenting with Paul Jaminet. Um, I blog at thedomesticman.com. Paul is at perfecthealthdiet.com. Um, first of all, thank you for Paul for uh, co-presenting with me. He's kind of my paleo hero. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, ancestral foods and from a gourmet approach. So to start things off, let's look at a common conception of taste and healthiness. So the initial idea is that the only way to keep your health is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. And that's from Mark Twain. So that's kind of a common conception today is that, you know, in order to be healthy, you got to kind of eat your salads and do the things you don't want to really do. So when we look at it that way, when we're talking about paleo eating, that is a healthful way of eating, which means that we're, paleo is a way of doing things that we don't actually want to do. So the opposite of that would be gourmet eating. Everyone wants to eat gourmet meals, you know. So if that's the case, and that paleo is designed for healthfulness, that means that gourmet is designed for taste. And does that mean that taste opposes healthfulness? And in that sense also, does paleo oppose gourmet eating? So Paul, what do you think about that? Well, I, I disagree. <laughs> um, So, um, if the if taste opposes healthfulness, then I think you know. First of all, we have to ask why do we have taste preferences? You know, why do we have preferences for uh, certain kinds of food? And those are really uh, innate things in the brain. They must have evolved. And so, uh, assuming they evolved in the Paleolithic, why did we evolve a taste for gourmet food? Uh, okay. Um, so why did we evolve a, a taste for gourmet food in the Paleolithic? Uh, all right, if that was our evolutionary environment, uh, you know, was it because it was very valuable to enrich the gourmet chefs of the Pleistocene, or uh, was it because you know gourmet meals cause heart attacks and there was great value in having heart attacks in, in the Paleolithic? Uh, probably not. So. Uh, I think we have to be skeptical uh, just on evolutionary principles of this idea that taste opposes healthfulness. And so let's look at data. And there's some, one thing that I find very fascinating about uh, the data on how people eat, and it explains why the epidemiologists like Walter Willett at Harvard uh, have been really unable to figure out what the optimal diet is. Uh, is that almost everyone eats the same diet if they have a, you know, everyone who has a similar income eats a very similar diet. And when you look around the world, uh, diet is almost entirely determined by income. Uh, so here's a chart of fat intake versus income. And you can see as income goes up, fat intake increases. Um, and it comes down to, Here's a chart on the upper left, carb intake versus income. You can see uh, as people's income goes up, uh, carb intake goes down. Protein is pretty stable with income, but it, uh, because there's a strong appetite uh, for a certain amount of protein every day. Uh, but uh, basically we can split the diets in the world into two global diets. Uh, the global poor eat you know, basically the diet advocated by the vegan and vegetarian doctors like uh, McDougall, Pritikin, Ornish, uh, Furman, etc. Uh, a plant-based diet, uh, mostly cereal grains, about 70% carb, 11% protein, 19% fat, so low-fat diet. Uh, the global rich eat what's commonly called the Western diet, 
uh, typically about 50% carb, 13% protein, 37% fat. And everywhere in the world we look, we see people eating the same diet, and food manufacturers target this. Uh, you know, so that's actually the, it's the composition of a McDonald's uh, supersized value meal. It's the composition of, uh, of the USDA nutritional guidelines, the American Heart Association nutritional guidelines. Uh, and that's natural because it's the way everybody eats, so it's sort of the default recommendation. And if people can't come up with strong recommendations for varying it, uh, then that's what the authorities recommend. Um, and so why do we see this pattern? Why does everybody eat the same way? Well, it looks like people's food choices are really influenced by just two things. These evolved innate food preferences and then the cost of food in terms of both time and money. So uh, there's a money component and that's why income matters. When people are poor, they go for the cheapest food, which turns out to be cereal grains. Um, but there's also an availability component, so everybody wants to save time. Uh, in fact, the global rich may be even shorter of time than the global poor, and, uh, and so they eat what's available, and what's most available are you know, these carb-rich, flour, bread, noodle, sugar products. Uh, those are the cheapest. Uh, the food manufacturers have an incentive to make food with those ingredients because they're so cheap. So what we see is that the global poor subsist on these uh, inexpensive carbohydrates, and the global rich eat more animal food, which they prefer, uh, but uh, they're still probably influenced toward carbohydrate-rich foods. So if we only see two diets in the world, um, you know, that's why uh, 20, 30 years ago, in you know, the diet field, there would be the standard guidelines, which would be very similar to the Western diet. And then you'd have these you know, renegade vegetarian plant-based diet doctors who say, well, you know, we see the global poor don't have as much obesity, diabetes. Uh, you know, of course, they have much shorter lifespans, but maybe that's because of, you know, because of some other factor connected to their low incomes, not their diets. And so they would recommend the diet, you know, the diets of the global poor, even though the life expectancy of the global poor was 50 years and the life expectancy of Western dieters was 80 years. Uh, and so that diet, you know, never really became uh, a threat to the mainstream because it's not very palatable. Um, and actually it's not very helpful either. Uh, but those were really the only two competitors in the arena of public opinion until recently until the emergence of low carbon paleo. So let's look at uh, the paleo alternative. And that was motivated by uh, discoveries by anthropologists that paleolithic skeletons look pretty healthy. You know, they don't have cavities. Uh, they don't have other signs of uh, problems. And also the realization from studies of hunter gatherers that their diet is quite different than the two diets we see in the uh, in the world today. So this is an old paper by Lauren Cardain. Um, look at sources, plant foods versus animal foods. Uh, animal and fish typically provide like 70% of calories. Uh, that automatically makes the diet lower carb than any of the modern diets. And those plant sources, many of them are fatty. Uh, you know, so people eat a lot of fatty nuts and uh, you know, things like coconuts and palm fruit. Uh, avocados. So, uh, you know, so actually uh, hunter-gatherer diets are probably typically about 20% carbs, 15 to 30% protein, 35 to 65% fat. And here's another study, detailed modern study of the uh, best studied modern hunter-gatherers. And look at the meat line. Uh, percentage of calories, 79%, 75%, 77%, 78%. Uh, there's a few that are lower, uh, and those few that are lower, like the new pack, uh, they're listed as 40% of calories from fruit, but those are mostly fatty fruits, not sweet fruits, uh, like the palm fruit. And so they're generally eating lower carbs, much higher fat uh, than moderners. And why is that? Well, it simply gets back to the cost in terms of time and availability. Uh, 
An antelope has hundreds of thousands of calories. Uh, a cluster of two birds might have 100 calories per pound. All right, and that's you know roughly a pound of uh, two birds. And so a person to get 2,000 calories a day from two birds, uh, you have to collect 20 pounds, process it, eat it. Uh, that's a lot of walking. Uh, and in fact, just to get to these 20% uh, carb diets, uh, hunter-gatherer women often walk six to 12 miles a day foraging uh, for carbohydrates. So um, it's quite plausible uh, that these Paleolithic and hunter-gatherer diets are too low carb just because it's so difficult to collect carbohydrates in the wild. Uh, so that 20% carb intake is probably below the optimum uh, because of the high cost of gathering carbohydrates. Modern diets are probably too high carb uh, because the carbs are the cheapest and most available foods. Uh, so it's likely that our optimum diet is somewhere in between. And if that's the case, uh, then maybe what we should do is just follow our evolved food preferences, not let our food environment distort uh, what we eat based on time and availability, but make an investment of time and money in order to obtain the tastiest possible foods. Uh, and then maybe that will be our healthiest diet. And so maybe what we should do is follow food reward to a gourmet cuisine uh, that's based on ancestral foods. And the ancestral foods part may be very important because um, if, you know, there may be other things that stimulate these innate evolved taste preferences that aren't actually nourishing. And that's why we can have modern addictions like cocaine that appeal to these evolutionary old uh, things with uh, compounds that are not, you know, that are novel and are not beneficial for us. But if we eat ancestral foods, then our evolved preferences should be a reliable guide to what's good for us. Uh, and in that case, you know, which paleo guru should you follow? Well, maybe it should be uh, a gourmet advocate of gourmet cuisine. And if you look at what do gourmet people advocate, it's actually not that far off from what you might read on paleo blogs. So some quotes from Julia Child, the only time you eat diet food is while you're waiting for the steak to cook. Fat gives things flavor. If you're afraid of butter, use cream. And the most influential moment in her life was when she had her first gourmet French meal. Uh, the thing she ate, oysters, white wine, scalloped potatoes with a creamy buttery sauce, roast duck. Uh, those are all tasty foods. Uh, they're also perfect health diet foods, if I can uh, put that in. So let's go back to that question of gourmet versus paleo. Paleo is designed for healthfulness. Gourmet is designed for taste. But if taste and healthfulness are one, then paleo and gourmet should be the same thing. So we need to synthesize paleo and, paleo and gourmet, uh, get the ancestral foods, uh, but make gourmet meals out of them. Uh, and so Russ, now Russ is a, if you've ever seen a site, he's a great gourmet chef. So um, he's a better guru than uh, Julia Chan. <laughs> I, I wrote my uh, So Thanks, Paul. So to, to look at the idea of synthesizing both gourmet and, and paleo, I think the best approach is to take the best of both worlds. So here's a little chart of, every, of both strategies here. You can see that on the paleo side, you know, you take health first, which I think is very important. Uh, and then you, you use a restricted food set based on the current science, basically. Uh, then you get rid of a couple of the other ideas. The idea that we have only been doing paleo, cooking paleo, for about 10 years now. You know, how long have paleo cook, cookbooks been out? Not that long. Uh, and the other part is that we use uh, often offbeat ingredient substitution. You know, so we, we throw coconut flour into things that usually would not have coconut in. So looking at the gourmet side of things, they, they are taste first, which I think can go well with paleo and maybe be co-first, if you will, to be taste and healthfulness both together. Uh, the other side of that is that gourmet cooking has been around for a long time, at least a thousand years. You know, you see when social stratifications came out, you know, people on the higher end were, were eating really well. Those were very similar to meals that we probably should be eating now. 
Another part of that, they, they use complementary ingredients, what they had geographically available, and they tried to be in, uh, ingenious and come up with new ways of using those to make complex flavors. So here's what, what I'm trying to get at here. So there's two different approaches right here. So the first one is a rotisserie chicken and steamed vegetables from the Paleo Solution. This is from Rob Wolf, if you're in here, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> this is a very restricted food set, right? So you're just eating a chicken that you get from a grocery store and some steamed vegetables. No butter, no salt, nothing on there. Uh, then you can look over here from Sever Magazine. There was a crawfish etouffee they, they featured last year in their mag or last month in their magazine, which was made with stock, butter, cream, scallions, garlic, celery, onion, tomatoes, peppers, and bacon served over rice. There was also some wheat involved, but I didn't put that up there. Um, <clears throat> so this is a gourmet meal. It's, it's, they use an unlimited food set. They take everything that's available and tasty and, and cook it together in the, the perfect way, basically, after a thousand years of trying it, getting it wrong, and that kind of thing. So this is very complementary ingredients, complex flavors, and we will probably get there in the paleo way as well, but why not try just looking at gourmet foods first and, and let them do the legwork? So, here are three, uh, three approaches I think that are important to uh, make a distinction with gourmet cooking. Number one is that they try to balance of flavors uh, using seasonings, acids, and fats in every dish. You'll see that in almost every gourmet dish. There's, a, there's a, a perfect balance that they come up with over time. The second part is that they, there's a focus, if maybe an obsession, with natural umami flavors. So that you always see broths, mushrooms, uh, ripe tomatoes, a lot of tomato sauce. Uh, seaweeds, fermented fish pastes and sauces. You see anchovies in the Western Europe. You see uh, fish sauce in, the, in Asia. So <clears throat> the third part of that is the gourmet dishes. Like it or not, they require extended cooking processes. So it's, it's, a, it's a long investment in preparation or in cooking in these foods. And I think that's an important part of our heritage. And I think it's, it's something that we can't just throw together quick meals and expect it to be incredibly tasty, rewarding, uh, as well as uh, nutrient dense. So let's go, for, let's go uh, over a few recipes that, uh, that have been featured on my blog or will be in my cookbook next year. Um, <clears throat> so here's one here where it's, it's kebabs, right? It's the easiest food in the world. You just take some meat, you put it on a stick, and you put it over fire, right? I mean, that's how it, that's how it actually evolved is from uh, people in, in Turkey putting it on swords and cooking it over a fire. But over time, you know, having to cook with various different types of meats, you had to implement other ways to make it tastier. So a lot of people don't, don't realize that there's a large investment in kebabs. You usually have to marinate them overnight with onion, lemon, vinegar, any of these acids to kind of break down the meat, as well as spices like marjoram and that kind of thing. Uh, the other part is that for at least a thousand years, uh, there's some ancient texts from India that say, that are at least 1,200 years old, that say that they basted their uh, kebabs in fats as they were cooking. So I think it's important to, to have that balance of acids and fats, and we see that right here. Another one is congee, which is a rice porridge. I know we're talking about rice at the Baylor Conference, sorry. <clears throat> so this is a very fast and easy way of getting calories to warriors in China, and congee's been around as long as rice has been around, because people have been overcooking rice as long as they've been cooking rice. So. <clears throat> It evolved into being a gourmet dish around the Tang Dynasty in the 7th century where people started incorporating other sources of umami into something that's very bland and uh, just calorie dense. So you see, uh, today, you'll see that um, most of the time they're cooked with a whole chicken, so you get all the nutrients from the bone broths and everything, and as well as including salted eggs, rice, wine, fish sauce, dried fish, mushrooms, ginger, these are all natural sources of umami to make it very tasty. And the final one, is what's often considered the tastiest fi uh, food in Western cuisine, which is beef bourguignon. So this is, a, again, a very simple meal that was made for poppers that, was, that became hot cuisine over time. And it's, it's made, again, with acids and fats. So you'll see red wine, stock, herbs, and aromatic veggies to get that natural umami flavor. So in conclusion, to bring it all home, so if we're looking at a paleo perspective and that if food reward is actually what we want to follow in order to be healthy, then the best way to do that is to do an gourmet approach, which is the most rewarding way of eating, basically, but from an ancestral perspective. So if we broaden our food palette to include traditional gourmet approaches and representatives from all food types, current paleo recipes can be modified to make a ancestral gourmet cuisine. And that's it.
Through us and Paul, uh, we have time for a couple questions if anybody would like to come up. Hi. Oops. Uh, thanks for an uh, interesting talk. Um, just keen to comment that I think what you are touching into here is maybe the most important and significant challenge that we in the paleo community have uh, to um, increase the awareness amongst uh, chefs and food people uh, that healthy cooking can be very tasty as well. Just wanted to have your thoughts on how we can sort of increase the awareness and get more chefs uh, restaurant people interested in what we are doing here? Well, I, think it's, I think that's a great question. Um, I would answer that by saying that I think that'll probably just come on its own. I think the chefs usually cook towards what their their uh, eaters want to eat, right? And I think that as the paleo movement becomes larger and more well known, I think that that's just going to be uh, something that kind of uh, happens in that way. Uh, and I think it's just something that'll, that'll probably break its way into the cooking world. Uh, I'm doing my best to try to get into the cooking world myself, so maybe I can be that the person that, that pushes that forward into the gourmet cuisine. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And uh, you know, one thing I can say, I was surprised when we first came out with our, our book. Uh, you know, maybe as many as 20% of the early buyers of our first edition were chefs. And, you know, so uh, chefs are keenly interested in new ideas in the food world and uh, uh, you know, ways of putting food together. You know, so I think, you know, we can uh, be confident that they're uh, listening to us. And as paleo moves away from, you know, very restricted you know, types of meals that don't taste as good as far as very tasty food, and as we continue to prove that our way of eating has great health benefits, uh, I think the chefs will be listening, and I think it, you know, it is going to happen. Hi, I'm Sally. It's nice to see cooking on the program. I've heard someone call real cooking grandma cooking, which is not an... Let's, let's, we'll Can step. I just speak without that thing? Is that sure, sure. Okay. And we'll step behind uh, the speakers. So. You know, I'm, I'm a person majority of Americans today, the children don't know the difference between one vegetable and the next. They don't know how to use a peeler. People don't have knife skills. I've got good friends with PhDs and interesting careers coming over. If they're so afraid of their kitchens. Their kitchens are dysfunctional. My mother-in-law's kitchen is a nightmare. She's never bothered in her 70-something years to make her kitchens dysfunctional. There's a, just a huge cultural kind of revulsion around the fun of knife skills and putting flavors together and all that creativity is lost on Americans. Do you have any comments about our cultural obstacles to getting people back in the kitchen? So, I, I do. I, I'll go without the mic here. I'm, I'm in the Navy, so I'm used to shouting, right? So, so I would say with something like that, the, the biggest part of that would be that we have to leverage what, the tools that we have in order to bring back those ideas. Uh, one good example is the fact that I do a lot of my recipe development using YouTube videos. So a lot of people are making these videos of here, here's me cooking and it's fun and that kind of thing. And I think the people are drawn to a visual way of learning. So I think that might be a great way of sitting down with a family. I have a four year old son, he loves watching his cooking things with me. Uh, I think that's a, a good way of trying to leverage the tools that we have to try to still bring back kind of those old styles of cooking and that kind of thing. Paul, do you have any comments? Yeah, um, I, think, I think videos are great. It's, you know, one of the things um, I, I, I've for years been reading uh, obituaries of centenarians in order to look for common elements. And you know, in terms of food, the most common, uh, the, the thing that centenarians have in common is that they love to cook. And, uh, and I think that's even more essential today than it ever was in the past because the alternative of not cooking prepared foods are worse than ever. And uh, um, you know, so if you cook at home, you, you automatically eat a natural whole foods diet, so it's an ancestral diet, really. Um, and I think, you know, people just don't enjoy things they're not good at. And, you know, so part of it's the time commitment, uh, you know, but it takes skill to know how to do things efficiently. Uh, things become more pleasurable as we become more skillful at them. 
Uh, you know, so people have to be willing to learn, and then cooking can become fun. But it's not fun at the beginning. And uh, you know, so we have to motivate people to tell them how important it is to cook for your health. Uh, and then as they start cooking, that they may find it can be quite pleasurable. And you know, so people do all kinds of things that I don't consider pleasurable, like gardening. And, you know, but uh, people can get pleasure from them. You know, after they start doing them and become good at them. Cooking is the same way. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's hopeless, but there's definitely a lot of work to do. Thank you, Russ and Paul. The next talk will be starting in just a couple minutes.